So good afternoon, everyone. As I shared earlier, uh, for those of you who are already in the room, my name is Courtney Aguirre, and I am a program manager at SCAG who works on uh, transportation safety. I want to thank you for joining us for the 10th session of SCAG's Traffic Safety Peer Exchange Series. I'll be facilitating today's session along with Tracy McMillan, Associate Principal with Nelson and Nygaard, who is one of our consultants supporting this project. Um, as I had shared earlier, and you've seen in the chat by now, perhaps, uh, we'd encourage you to type your name and organization, if you have one, into the chat feature, as well as your pronouns. That's going to help us, again, know who's in the room, and it'll help us ensure that this feature is working for you. Um, next slide, please. Thanks, Edward. Um, so this peer exchange is anticipated to run for about an hour and a half. Uh, right now, all of your participant lines should be muted, but if you have a question during a presentation, feel free to type it into the chat box or raise your hand and we'll call on you to unmute yourself. Um, and if you do think of something later, you can reach out to me or contact our presenters. Um, we're going to e be emailing all presentations to folks who registered for today's uh, session, for today's um, meeting. And within those presentations, you should be able to find that contact info for the presenters. So today's regionally specific peer exchange is going to be including presentations focused on traffic safety issues in suburban communities, highlighting efforts in Riverside and San Bernardino and the work of a community based organization. Um, and what I would like to say is that we, we want this to be as interactive and participatory as possible, and we do want to highlight experiences of our audience as well. So if you have questions for the pre presenters, uh, we, again, more than welcome those. But if you'd also like to share your experiences, your challenges, your successes, we'd um, really encourage you to highlight them for us during the Q&A, which will uh, come at the end. Um, so we're going to have a panelist Q&A as well as a facilitated group discussion. That's the opportunity when we hope you'll share with us what your challenges and uh, your experiences and your successes have been. Um, we're especially interested in hearing, again, your reactions to the presentations and your experiencing working in counties, whether it's Riverside, San Bernardino, or Orange County, whatever your um, suburban uh, planning or safety experience has been. We welcome um, all of your perspectives. So to start things off, I'd like to share um, a quick update on our region's existing conditions and our Go Human program. So Edward, if you could advance one more slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, we, we didn't even get to um, the land acknowledgement, which we um, have built in really to all, all of our all of our sessions thus far. If you'll give me one brief moment. Sorry, my screen was frozen. There we go. So as, as staff at SCAG, I acknowledge we're on the land of the Chumash, Tonga, and the Keech. As we acknowledge we are on the original lands of the Chumash, Tonga, and Keech peoples and how deeply the field of urban planning continues to engage with land, we offer this acknowledgement as a first step to more conversations and actions that will support indigenous communities in thriving. Thank you, Edward. If you could advance one more slide. Right, and so these are the presentations we're going to be hearing today. Uh, but again, you're going to be encouraged to as participating in the session to share your experiences and perspectives with us. Uh, next slide, please. Right, and so to start things off, as I said, I'd like to share a quick update on our region's existing conditions and our Go Human program. And Edward, if you could advance one more slide, that would be great. Thank you. So as many of you are likely well aware, our region is home to roughly 19 million people, about half the state's entire population, and about 13 million drivers. And each year on average, 1,500 people are dying, 5,500 people are seriously injured, and another 124,000 are sustaining serious injuries in traffic collisions in our region. Collisions are occurring in every community in our region, uh, from Anaheim in Orange County to uh, 
Fontana and San Bernardino County. However, the vast majority, more than 70% of our fatal and serious injury collisions are occurring in urban areas, and almost 70% are occurring on our local roads and across the entire region, we know that about a quarter of our collisions are the result of unsafe speed. Um, and this is important to note as the survivability in a collision decreases significantly with increases in speed. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. So this information and more detailed analysis is included in our regional transportation safety existing conditions report, which we're going to link to in the chat and you can see on the screen before you. We just completed an update of this report in June. Uh, it provides, again, that region-wide and county level breakdowns for you. And I think Michael, who's handling the chat today, is going to be able to share some links to some county fact sheets for you for Orange Riverside as well as San Bernardino counties. And so in our efforts uh, to eliminate serious injuries and fatalities across the region, uh, we engage in a variety of efforts at SCAG, including these pair exchanges and our Go Human campaign. Next slide, please. So the Go Human campaign launched in 2015 to reduce traffic collisions and encourage people to walk and bike more. Uh, now, since then, Go Human activities have expanded the conversation beyond vehicular violence into a suite of programs that mainly fall into these three categories highlighted on the slide before you. The first is co-branded safety messaging materials that can be requested right now on the Go Human website at no cost. They come in different forms like lawn signs, banners, bus shelter ads. Um, Variety, a variety of options are available for you. Uh, Go Human also provides a kit of parts at no cost. Um, the kit is a set of modular pieces that can be assembled to demonstrate different street design treatments like parklets, bulb outs, and crosswalks. And the kit uh, comes with marketing materials to show how typical how typical a typical street can transform into one that centers pedestrian and bicyclist. Um, bicyclist users. So safety workshops, webinars, and technical assistance. Um, uh, are also provided through the Go Human program. Um, we, we really have a variety of options for you. And so next slide, please. What we would encourage you to do is um, go ahead and visit our Go Human website where you can explore the different options that may uh, work well for you and your communities as we all aim to uh, advance transportation safety and uh, eliminate uh, traffic fatalities and serious injuries. And you can see on the slide before you, I've highlighted additional uh, traffic safety peer exchanges that are occurring. We have two more after this one, a total of 12, uh, the next on August 3rd, and then on August 10th. Um, and so if you do have an interest in learning more about Ventura and Los Angeles counties and rural community challenges and opportunities, as well as those within an urban environment in LA County, um, please, please do consider joining us. So if you could advance one more slide. Thank you. And so we'd like to kick things off today with um, asking a couple questions of you um, through Zoom. So the first question, do you live or work in Orange, Riverside or San Bernardino County? And then we're asking just briefly, what are the most significant challenges in improving safety in your communities? Um, we have some examples for you, political support, community support, funding for planning, funding for infrastructure and other. And we know there are a lot of you know, potential challenges you're encountering and what we'd encourage you to do, again, if, if there are others that are really top of mind for you or other, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat. And so I do see, uh, some information's coming in. It's, it's good to see that most folks joining us today um, are, are working or living in uh, Orange Riverside or San Bernardino County. Um, and in terms of, I see the results coming in for the most significant challenges, and this can really help shape our discussion today. Um, I do see that most people have responded that um, political support very significant challenge. And we're fortunate today to have a council member with us who perhaps can address um, some of your questions um, about this. And we also have uh, community support as well as funding for planning. Oh, and I see a big one here. The biggest is funding for infrastructure. Um, I think uh, folks today can certainly highlight um, how they have managed to um, secure that funding for infrastructure projects in their communities. Um, so thanks for sharing. This again should certainly help us as we um, share these presentations and facilitate the discussion today. Uh, 
And so what we'd like to do now is introduce our first presenter. Uh, I'd like to welcome Eric Cowell. Eric has a degree in civil engineering and an MBA from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, Eric and his spouse of 36 years have four children and relocated to Southern California, the desert region, over 15 years ago to be closer to family. He served as the transportation program manager for the Coachella Valley Association of Governments for the past five years and is the project manager for the CV Sync ITS project. Uh, welcome, Eric. Thank you, Courtney. Um, I guess I'm going to speak about the Coachella Valley. And for those of you that maybe aren't familiar with the Coachella Valley, we're a little bit outside of the main flow, but <clears throat> on the west, we have Palm Springs and Desert Hot Springs, but more those in Palm Springs used to be where people identified, but now people are more familiar with Coachella on our Eastern side, which coincides with a festival. It, at least we hope it will in the coming years. So um, that's kind of our boundary. Um, it's a desert region. And I'm gonna talk about how we develop projects and how we pay for them, You know, specifically tied to bicycles and pedestrians. Although uh, that holds for um, all, you know, safety for the vehicular traffic as well. Next slide. So we have in the Valley a transportation project prioritization study where we conduct it every five or six years. And when we do that, we come up with um, a project list of right now, uh, next click, uh, 235 projects right now. It's about $3 billion worth of cost. And it's ranked, each one's ranked from one to 235 on four regionally agreed upon criteria one of which is safety. And so that's 25% of the project score comes from safety. Where is safety? Well, safety is crashes and fatalities, accidents and fatalities. And that primarily comes from SWITERS um, in the acronym soup of transportation. It's the statewide integrated traffic record system and TIMS, which takes SWITERS and, and makes it into more information and not as much data, but it all comes from there. And, and that's what we base 25% of our project selection on is safety. Next click, next slide. So one of the funding sources that we use for safety um, is HSIP. That's federal money for highway safety improvement program. Our communities in our valley, we have nine cities um, and the county of Riverside they've been very successful in obtaining these federal funds. These are generally smaller projects, a million dollars or less, or maybe $2 million or less. Um, and the region has, has, has received funding for these projects as well. Well, starting in this year, um, we are now, now required to have a local road safety plan uh, for the first time. And that local road safety program, next click, um, is, is systematically identifies and analyzes safety problems, recommending improvements and prioritizes a list. So that's kind of what we were doing, right? Um, for, from CVEG standpoint, but now our, our communities are required to do it if they are um, applying for these federal funds and the region will do it as well. So it's a little bit different, but that is one of our primary funding sources for safety. Next click. And again, even in these local road safety plans, as I see them coming together in the valley, it's crashes and fatalities, accidents, fatalities, and it's coming from splitters. So it's the same data, um, same accidents, fatalities, um, and, and it's historic data. So next click. So, you know, what's missing or what's wrong? Well, it's, it, it's uh, this is kind of our point of view again. So if we look at the year 2022, so coming into to next year, um, the most recent TPPS, that's our transportation project prioritization study, will be from 2016 because um, we haven't updated it yet. We'll, we'll start updating it uh, probably next year. But the one we have now is from 2016. So that means the data that's in that is from 2012 to 2014 years. Um, 
So remember, safety was 25% of the score, and that means the safety data came from 2012, 13, and 14. Next click. That's eight to 10 year old data um, that we're basing our prioritization on in 2022. Um, there's, it's next click. It just seems useless to me. Um, think, think of an accident in your neighborhood or in your community that happened 10 years ago. And we, if the data just exists without any context, without any public engagement, without any anything, does it have any relevance to today? Um, who knows? Um, and it's it's old data. It's not new data. So that's and yet that's what we're basing a quarter of our prioritization of our scores. Next click. Was there community engagement? Um, no. <laughs> we just talked about the process that that was for the local road safety plans and the and our TPPS. It took for the safety component. It took Switter's data. Um, the community wasn't engaged at all. Next click. And again, we have content without context. Next click, it's useless. Next click, the um, sense of place. We have arterials and I'm sure you all do in our region where um, they, we have arterials that go through residential neighborhoods that go by elementary schools, middle schools, high schools. And then we also have arterials that in, in, in the desert here run along mile after mile of gated community with no pedestrian or bicycle destinations at all. Very little, uh, still have sidewalks, but very little pedestrian destinations. Um, they're different. And there's no, there's no difference when we design these roads. Um, we use the same templates. Next, next page. So to the funding, you know, we had HSIP, which was the highway safety, but we've also been very successful with active transportation, ATP applications. Um, our region, both our cities within the region and our region itself have been, have been very successful in obtaining these funding. Um, next click. Um, we, we pride ourselves on coming up with innovative and transformative solutions um, for bicycles and pedestrians especially. Um, next click. You know, here's, here's something that's worked its way into just as, and I'll have a couple of examples here. I could spend an hour just on this, but um, you know, a, a bend out when you come to an intersection for a bike route, bike lane, su such that you separate it, you give the driver opportunity to see the rider, the rider opportunity to see the driver. It's just a much safe, much safer application um, for an intersection. And yet, I'm not aware of one intersection in the valley where we've done a widening project where the initial project included this. And yet, I know that there's been half a dozen of our of our applications that have gone in for ATP that have included this as a design consideration that was funded. So um, next click. Cycle tracks, go ahead and you can click the other two pictures in. So, you know, separating the bicycles um, from from the vehicles with barriers, with raised barriers, post barriers, um, separated, you know, there's the last one shows parking, um, but cycle tracks. Again, our ATP applications that have been successful have started to include cycle tracks um, where it's not just a striped bike lane, a five foot striped bike lane on the side of the road. It's actually an accommodation that's you know, maybe 12 feet wide or 10 feet wide. Um, next slide. We've also included things like um, raised Median crossings and refuge islands. There's another click on that one. Um, again, commonly used in our ATP applications, but I, I've yet to see, again, one of our projects that we fund every year for widening um, include this as a design component. So I guess the question is, why are we doing this for our, eight, for our, our ATP and our HSIP applications? but we're not doing it in our project design. Um, next click. Next slide. So we are doing a local road safety program as, or plan as well uh, for our region, not, not just for the jurisdiction. And it's gonna be a living document, um, but we're gonna try and fix that a little bit. Um, go ahead and click. 
right now it's the data identifies the problem you put it in a plan and then you address that problem in the future that's kind of the the default mechanism for most safety funding um, you take the data put it in a plan and address it at some point in the future next click what we'd like to be doing is what can be done quickly um, we still want the data the data is still very important but let's not wait till the data is 10 years old let's you know what what if there's a a pedestrian uh, fatality i'll use a quick example in one of our cities a mayor came to our our executive committee at CBAG very impassioned back in 2016 there have been two fatalities two pedestrian fatalities in his community um, both of them walking on a unimproved part of this uh, city where it was a just a two lane road with no shoulder and no sidewalks and on the corner was a quick trip and the people were walking to the quick trip on the edge of the pavement and they were hit and killed um, very impassioned plea the project was on our list of 235 projects and so immediately went to work on getting that prioritized and funded and got it funded within three three months it was ready to go and with all of our best efforts and the city's best efforts and the county's best efforts and the county is the lead it looks like we might go to construction next spring and that's you know that's going to be six years later and it was pedestrians struck and killed ostensibly because there wasn't a safe place for them to walk um why did we need to wait six years well you know in california we've got environmental processes and we've got right-of-way acquisitions and we've got but at the same time, a sidewalk could have been put in place within you know, 30 days um, on city right of way um, and, and probably fix 90% of the problem and then fix it the rest of the problem down the road when that roadway project is accomplished. So that's one of the things we're trying to do with our regional long range local road safety program is to find ways to address some of the problems immediately, um, find a way to set aside some funding every year regionally that can be used immediately. Um, if everybody agrees that there's a, a, a solid nexus between design and the accident or fatality, and it's something that be, can, can be done quickly, let's just do it. Let's not, let's not put it into the five-year queue of letting that project get funded. So that, that, that's one of the goals. So next click. One of the tools that we're gonna use to accomplish that is regional design guidelines. Um, we, we, we have a consultant putting together some design guideline for us to get it right the first time. Um, so when we widen a, a, an arterial, again, these are all regional arterials, uh, let's put our innovative and transformative solutions into the original design. Um, let's start putting the things that we put into our HCIP applications and we put into our ATP applications, let's start putting those things into our initial design. And let's uh, go ahead and click. Um, you know, it's not going to, we're going to supplement with these guidelines. We're not, we're not going to replace design documents. We're not going to replace some of the guidance already out there and the standards out there. We're just going to supplement it with best practices and things that we've even, mostly things that we've even done in our own desert. Next click. Um, you know, consistent application of multi-jurisdictional uh, facility selection across our region. We're nine different cities and the county um, all kind of like a snake. It's, it's all one after the other. It's all in a row. Um, and yet we'd, we'd like to have, you know, the traveling public, um, especially pedestrians and bicycles should have a, a sense of place. They should have a sense that as they travel between communities, that they're still in the same world. You know, they're, they're not going from, you know, very nice facilities to, to non-existent facilities to very nice and getting into everything in between. Let's, let's get some consistent application and let's make sure that those applications connect to where those communities are. Next click. Um, we're gonna, we intend, we haven't done this, we're in the process of doing this. We intend to make this a component of our funding reimbursement agreements. When we fund the pro, when we, the region, fund a project, we fund 75% of it and the local jurisdiction pays for 25% of it. So we're gonna put this into our reimbursement agreements, probably some checklists and probably some meetings and requirements, not really adding cost, but just making sure that at the beginning of a project, that this isn't just a, a pure engineering solution to a highway to a to an arterial widening project. That we are looking at bikes and beds, we are looking at innovative and transformative solutions. So it will be in our reimbursement agreement. So we have a carrot. Next click. 
Um, and again, community involvement that as these end up augmenting general plans, um, we'd like this to involve a little bit of community involvement. Right now, right now they don't, it's just pure engineering. Um, next click. Uh, and that's one of my favorite quotes. And so I always use it to end my presentations and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Thank you for the um, very interesting presentation. I appreciate the challenges that you highlighted. One that resonates with me is the data piece, right? Uh, we too um, struggle, right, with having current data um, just for our, our purposes and analysis. And at the local level, I understand that can be a significant challenge as well. Um, I do have one, uh, a couple, two questions that were directly messaged to me. Um, if we can pause for a moment with you and just um, one question, your regional design guidelines that you referenced, I think you said a consultant is working on with you. Do you know if those will be available to share with others in the region? Yeah, ab well, absolutely. When um, we had a draft and we'll hopefully be approving the actual document uh, in, in the fall, September, November, um, it's really nothing out of the ordinary. It's just a lot of best practices, especially and, and guidelines of how to make things be consistent. And it will be a public document. It'll be shared on our website. Um, and, and, and as I've said, we will require our local jurisdictions to, to take a look at it when they design projects. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like an enormously, potentially an enormously helpful resource for locals in your region and elsewhere. Um, the additional question that we have is um, what standards and processes need to change in the project review process for these designs to be required at the outset rather than retrofitted via ATP and HSIP funding? And I'm thinking that those design guidelines are getting at that, right? Um, it's, for us, yeah. it's making it for us, it's putting it into our if, if it doesn't tie to the money, then then we can't we as a region can't make it happen. But if we tie it to our money, um, if you're going to use regional money, then you have to follow regional guidelines. And some of the regional guidelines are is that, you know, perhaps and this part hasn't all been written yet, but at the very beginning of a project before it even goes out to design when it gets approved for funding. Um, that may be pre-designed, there's a checklist. Have you considered, have you considered, has there been public engagement? Um, and there may be other points inside of the project where we stop and pause and take a look at, are we truly putting the, faci the, the facilities that we've selected, are, are they truly um, paying attention mm -hmm. to the community that the facility yeah. is going through? Yeah, yeah. Well, and thank that, you. So in us, yeah. the process is tying it to the funding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, I appreciate those insights. I haven't seen anything else come in through the chat for you. Um, Tracy or Michael, I don't know if anyone has their hands raised. If not, if there's anything else, but if I not. Don't, I don't okay. think it, I, yeah, I think no other okay. questions at this time. So okay. do we want okay, to move on it. to Marvin? Mm -hmm. Yep, of course. Um, there, and I'll hand it off to you, Tracy. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Eric. Great presentation. I was like trying to like, raise my, yeah make good points. <laughs> uh, well, I have the honor to introduce Marvin Norman, who is a policy specialist with the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice. Marvin is passionate about seeing an improvement in the mobility needs of the inland region and is fighting hard to see improvements in conditions in what has been rated the worst portion of the state for non-motorized activities. He believes that everyone deserves a fair and convenient means of traveling around the region. Marvin, thank you very much for being with us today. And we will now hand the floor over to you and Edward will get your presentation um, on the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And yeah, so as, um, as mentioned, I'm Marvin Norman, um, policy specialist with the Center for Community Action and Environmental Justice. And uh, we're a nonprofit agency focused on environmental justice, obviously as the name um, and we're based in Harupa Valley and do work in most of the Inland Valley region and elsewhere wherever community needs help. Um, and a lot of the stuff I am gonna talk about today though I did actually as part of the Inland Empire Biking Alliance more than here at CTAJ. I've only been here a couple months. So next slide, please. So um, how a little bit of background on how I got in, involved in this. Um, work, I didn't wake up one day and decide to necessarily be a, a safe streets advocate. And, um, you know, I grew up here in the Inland Empire, um, 
pretty typically. And so it wasn't until I was in my 20s. Um, and as you guys can see, maybe here, this, this tweet I, I grabbed, um, it, it kind of led me down this path. I started, um, I had a car that needed repair and I didn't feel like spending that much money on it at the time. So I started biking to work and stuff. Um, and then I realized the conditions were not uh, good for biking in the region generally. Um, and then I got involved with with activism and, you know, it's kind of spiraled. And so here I have a couple of links um, and I'm sure when the slides are shared, they'll be shared as well. Um, just kind of similar routes from different people that they enjoyed. Um, they just experienced something and realized, wow, I, I want to make some change and it let them in. And so that's how I actually got into biking. And then actually, after I started biking and talked with other family members and I discovered that, oh, so my uncles liked biking and my granddad um, from my mom's side and when he lived from my, in the island of Trinidad in the Caribbean, he actually never owned a car and was a lifelong bicyclist his whole life. And even after he went blind in his seventies or eighties and he would still get up and go on his um, uh, stationary bike. So let's next slide, please. Uh, quickly after starting getting Involved in advocacy, I, I stumbled upon the unsavory side of it. And not only was it not exciting to ride, but it was um, not very great for several people. And so um, I went on Twitters and the 2020 data is still supposedly preliminary, but between 2010 and 2020, um, we had a total of 170 people on bi bicycling who were killed in between the two county region. And I myself personally put up probably about a quarter of the ghost bikes for or about a quarter of these deaths and then have um, others have put up others, but we put up several ghost bikes, um, as you can see. And then in pedestrian uh, standpoint, this has been word, rated the worst area of the state by the dangerous, by, um, by design by uh, Transportation America. Uh, they're and their semi periodic report comes out. And so in 2011, we were the worst area in the state. 2014, we were the worst area worst area in the state. 2016, we were the second worst area in the state uh, behind only Bakersfield, but Bakersfield wasn't in the first two. So um, it, it wasn't doing great. And um, the pedestrian actually, honestly, is, is side is even worse than biking side in, in terms of deaths as far as I've seen. And so it has been you know, a frustrating thing. And a lot of what Eric was saying about, you know, how long it takes to address something that, like he had two, two people killed in 2016 and maybe they're going construction next year. That kind of thing has been very frustrating to see. Um, and so next slide, please. Um, and so, like I said, the experience has been frustratingly so, and so projects are, Face all kinds of headwinds. Um, like we have a project in Highland that is still stuck in Sequa for for years, and it was supposed to be constructed already, and it's still stuck in Sequa from ATP, for example. Um, and the, you know, some projects, the community comes out when they hear that, oh no, we're going to lose a lane, and so there's a lots of there has been some pushback in those instances. Um, and then also uh, the funding, uh, both San Bernardino County and Riverside County have their uh, self-help counties. And when their ballot measures most recently passed and I think 2002 and 2004 uh, for, for the current period, uh, they didn't really write in um, any money for active transportation per se. Like uh, I know measure M or, is, or measure R, whichever was the most recent one in LA, they wrote in a couple percentage for active transportation and then have recently taken steps to move money around uh, or move, make more projects uh, eligible for, for more money. Um, and that hasn't been done out here. Um, and we did see last year, I know RCTC have been planning to do a new ballot measure and they had to started discussing putting um, a dedicated pot for active transportation funding, but then once the whole pandemic uh, shutdowns and everything hit and they pulled the ballot measure, then that obviously is off the table. And you know, it also, it, it has a lot of cases been project by project. So, you know, we have to go single strip by single strip and, you know, you have to fight for every 
and and demonstrate why we need every single project as opposed to uh, which has been kind of good to hear eric's uh, again the standards you're putting in which will make it much easier um but when as a bike advocate um, i always kept saying uh, that my job should be to make myself out of a job because everything's being done already i don't i shouldn't have to be there um looking and trying to get everything done and the other thing is that you know we've been try kind of playing whack-a-mole on projects and that would make things worse and and a lot of these projects again are in long-range plans some of them were in the plans that were part of the approved ballot measures or whatever so you get the, you know these projects that are just happening by inertia that will make things worse but they're it, the response is like, well, it's in the plan, so we have we're going to go through with it, and then you you also get lots of resistance um, from the communities in some cases, um, and especially when they find out that it might have an iota of impact on driving, and then sometimes uh, from very selected officials as well who don't want their cities known or or city managers who don't think that some things are right for their city, um, and then. On the flip side of, of stuff being just uh, moving by inertia based on plans, there are the plans and policies that don't get followed, um, which is expressly the issue in active transportation facilities. Um, here on the left, I have a, a, a example um, from Fontana where uh, they have a, their um, active transportation plan calls for a cycle track in, on one location, and they were building a project, a, a warehouse, and you know, I provided comments and reminded them, hey, there's a cycle track here. And their response was that uh, we're, we're not, it's a bicycle path, it's a recreational project, and it's not going to be, it's not required to be part of the project. But at the same time, if it was, if, you know, if on their map, it had said the project, the ultimate width of the roadway was supposed to be six lanes, they would require them to do it. And so why wouldn't you require the bike facility and, and, so, you know, stuff like that and the plans and policies are rampantly disregarded and disregard. And next slide, please. So uh, this one is, is also something I've heard and kind of goes back to, you know, it's a, a lot of belief that the Inland Empire is, is not San Francisco. We're not Santa Monica. No, we're not like LA. We're different. No one, it's not feasible to bike or walk out here or even take transit for most people is, is what the common wisdom is um and this is often held by by various levels of people from you know everyone up and down to elected officials uh, city staff and etc you um and i find several problems with this you know um first you know, there there are a fair number of people in the region who are don't who already don't own a car uh, don't rely on a car either because they can't afford to rely on a car or they can't operate a car, you know, maybe they're kids. And these people still are here and they do get around. And, um, you can see that picture on the right, that's on um, 366 on Foothill Boulevard in San Bernardino. Um, these two people were here riding down the street and you, as you can see, um, there's not even so much of a sidewalk on the street and they're right under a 50 mile power sign. And I can assure you that people commonly use that as a min suggested minimum. Um, but this belief that we're the area is unsuitable for car non-car transportation does also create a perverse self-fulfilling prophecy, because uh, thus far, for the most part, we believe that no one it's not possible to not drive here, so no one's going to not drive here. So we won't build for people to not drive here because no one will not no one everyone will drive here, and so by doing so, you get again situations like on the right where now even if someone wanted to maybe try to walk there. How are they going to walk if you're um, in a wheelchair or pushing a stroller? How would you walk past here? Um, and so that's the issue that has been plaguing the issue. Um, so next slide, please. And then in tandem is that is the belief that um, oh, even if we provide the facilities, that that's too far. Um, so I mean, I in some places maybe you know maybe if people are living in like Trona and trying to go to to to, to Best Buy, they might have a problem. But in many parts of the inland region, especially in these newer master plan communities, they're not more than a mile or two from, in most cases, from their, from the basics. And so this is a area of view of Menifee. And if you can look close, squint close, you can see that um, I, I drew out a, um, 
use a measuring tool. And so this thing is this uh, image about is about a mile and a quarter wide um, on the above and below the the um, I think that's uh, Hoots Road. No, that's um, uh, Newport Road. That's cutting across the middle there, Menifee. And you can see there's a lot of shopping centers, and that most of the people who are living within these communities are within a mile, a mile and a half of of um, the shopping centers within the city. And and so, I mean, a lot of times, especially in these newer communities, what what ends up happening though is that maybe there's still a gap, like you can see on the south side of Newport, on on, and sort of one uh, between those two the left two leftmost circles, there's still like the um, farm or open land. And so that area, if it's undeveloped, maybe it doesn't have a sidewalk on one side. So it, if, even if people wanted to try to walk or, or, or bike to these locations, they would have a hard time. And also it's not very common to open the, the back ends of these centers to the neighborhood. And so even if someone lives on the street that's pretty close to physically to the store maybe three or four hundred feet um they are forced to go a, a mile half mile out of the uh, out of the community out to the arterial down to the corner try to make a left turn across three train three lanes of 50 miles per hour traffic and then into the the shopping center to, to get a jug of milk or whatever and and so there it may it's true that they, they don't have a far trip but we've just not made it possible to really make it an easy trip. Next slide, please. And so uh, continuing on this theme, uh, like I said, the physical distances often are not that ex actually exceedingly great. And while maybe people might have to drive to Santa Ana for, for work, for example, I have seen countless instances where my neighbors would drive a half mile to drop their kids off at school and sit in 20 minutes of traffic to do so. And so those are a lot of trips that are easy to, that are easily um, not driven if people are provided the opportunity to not be forced to drive for them. And maybe some people might be dropping their kid off and then driving to Santa Ana. And so maybe it doesn't make sense for them to, to not drive their kid, but a lot of people are, are not in that camp as well. And so the other thing too, is that uh, we, we actually see that some of the better um, cities in the state and country for bike and pedestrian infrastructure actually aren't even the big cities either. Uh, like for example, Davis is known as the most uh, bike, uh, the bike, the single city in the country with the highest bike mode share at around 20, 25%. And while some people will say, oh, well, you know, it's a college town. And so college town, of course, increases ridership. Um, having personally been to Davis, the actual bike infrastructure in Davis is while better than many of the communities here, I've also been to the Netherlands, so the infrastructure in Davis isn't really not that great and surely suppresses ridership. And so Davis is also similarly designed to many of the, uh, the other communities in here in the, in the Inland Empire and with, um, you know, more single family homes and stuff. And while, yes, sure, they have the college town with some call it, with some apartments close to college, you know, that's not much different than Riverside or Redlands for or um, even San Bernardino, um, several other cities with universities in the region as well. And so it, it, there certainly is opportunity to do more. And also we see in Sacramento, which is again, similar, for the most part, similarly designed, especially once you get to outlying parts. And they did a study um, with UC Davis and the other thing, they gave people access to the bike share and they found that people are, willing to, first people are willing to bike much farther than they would bike on a regular bike, on a bike, on an electric bike. And also that they are become more favorable toward biking, um, biking things. And so, you know, maybe it's, uh, it's maybe they might be more likely to support a bike lane or a bike lane project, for example. And all this is helpful. Um, I, I know personally, I've started seeing uh, people out here biking in the region who previously I don't think I would have seen biking who are on e-bikes. Uh, so next slide, please. So the, I know it sounds all mostly bleak and doom, but there, I mean, there are, there have been some progress. It's just as, as excruciatingly slow as it has been to watch. Um, you know, Redlands had the first green bike lanes in the region um, and some of their neighbors are, 
or were spurred to never to vow never to put in green bike lanes once they saw them. Um, so in, in Palm Desert, they have their under construction, they have the San Pablo Avenue with cycle tracks and the CV link, both of which were um, ATP grant applications to to um, to Eric's point. And then Riverside is constructing several cycle tracks. Rancho Cucamonga has one planned, et cetera. Um, um, there's the San Savine, there's CV link, um, some other trails in, and these longer regional trails. And again, I, I really like the, the the CV link actually as after dealing with the SART in, in San Bernardino Riverside counties, it's, it was good to see the CV link uh, be able to advance as essentially one project that was um, planned from the very beginning instead of the patchwork and frustratingly slow progress we've seen on the SART. Next slide, please. And so uh, what I think what we still need is uh, real commitments to, to actual safety. And so it's good to hear Eric, uh, you say that um, it sounds like you guys are starting to do kind of what is the basis of vision zero or the that's sustainable safety policy. And also the third bullet point there of, of money, but where basically we don't just build a road to current standards and then uh, wait for something to happen to file to then correct it after the fact with a, a safety improvement grant but we just start from the beginning and build it right from the beginning with what we know are known safety um and what, what you know known safety standards we, we wouldn't um need to then come back and write a grant and hope it's successful and so also it, again it's good to hear you guys are going to tie that to the money um Vision Zero and sustainable safety, or even if you don't want to put any of those names with it, whatever, but whatever you're planning, we definitely need to see the money behind it because, as we've seen from like LA, for example, they've been a Vision Zero city for about five or six years now, and um, not much has happened because they are unwilling to fund actual Vision Zero, the actual changes needed, and of course, they are maybe not rebuilding as much so that could be part of it but so and then also we need better design standards um one thing i, I think is re really lacking it could be a good start now is uh for a comprehensive network so you have a whole network and, and a network approach and this again comes back to where you could open up like sidewalk and access neighborhood access to shopping centers for example as part of networks and then again the inland empire has a lot of greenfield projects for better or worse um this again goes back to the point of if we're building it the first time, let's just build it right from the beginning. So, you know, we could put comprehensive networks in. And then, of course, we need a commitment to actually follow these plans. Um, and here on the left is an example. Um, this actually is a Dutch um, a suburban expansion where they went ahead and went as part of the expansion, they planned how to make sure that no one to minimize driving within the development and, and, um, to make sure that people have a direct route to the town to the to the center etc and that the network is the bike network and pedestrian network is planned um specifically from the beginning not just uh after thought based on um a separate set of plans that was prepared differently so next slide and that's it feeling done thank you well and that's any questions i'll be happy to take them Marvin, thanks so much for your presentation. It really struck me listening to your presentation and Eric's as well, that I mean, it maybe this is a, a frustrating statement for us all that that what you were talking about, obviously you you related a lot to what Eric had presented. And I think we can all relate to what the two of you have presented that um, sadly, these issues are not unique um, to the regions that you work in. We, we see this repeated over and over again um, across the, the state. And um, that's why we're here to talk about it and to share this information and to hopefully work collectively for, for change like we're, we're presenting and, and talking about. We're going to um, hold questions for right now and so that we can get to Denise's presentation and then um, council member Davis's presentation. And then we will move into questions uh, as a whole after um, she 
has presented. So I'll pass it back to Courtney to you. introduce the council member. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Marvin. I appreciated um, quite a lot how you um, connected to the work, right? You shared that personal history. Um, some of our speakers have done that in the past, and I, I enormously appreciate that myself as um, you know, I try to inject that when I can, you know, to make it a little bit more, um, you know, meaningful, personally meaningful. Um, so yes, so now we'd like to welcome Council Member Denise Davis. Uh, Denise was elected to the Redland City Council in 2018. She works full time as the director of the Women's Resource Center at UC Riverside, hosts the Persist podcast, and also serves as a public member on the Dental Hygiene Board of California. Um, I'd like to welcome you, uh, Council Member Davis. Um, take it away. Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here with you all today. Uh, thank you first and foremost to SCAG and Go Human for the opportunity to present. Um, thanks also to Eric and Marvin for those interesting and informative presentations. Those are hard acts to follow. I wanna start by saying that I said yes to this panel invitation because I was excited to learn um, from you all. Uh, you all are the experts. I'm certainly not the expert. So I'm looking forward to having a collaborative dialogue, hearing your thoughts, ideas, and experiences, particularly as it relates to crosswalk murals, which I will get into later. Um, first, I wanted to take the opportunity to highlight the great work being done by our city staff in Redlands. Thank you to our assistant engineer, Joanna Silva, for providing me with information on the recent traffic safety improvements we've achieved in the city of Redlands. Uh, next slide, please. I'll go over some of those. The first is uh, in July of 2017, the city was awarded the ATP Cycle 3 grant for the East Valley Corridor Bike Route Interconnect Project. The grant is state funded and coordinated through Caltrans and SBCTA. The project will close a number of gaps in the existing cycling infrastructure, provide improved bike circulation for users between downtown Highland, the Citrus Plaza, Mountain Grove shopping centers, and improve cycling safety in the western portion of Redlands, which is very exciting. Uh, next slide, please. We have a roundabout project coming soon. You know, pending funding, a roundabout will be installed on Wabash Avenue at Highland Avenue for safety improvements uh, for pedestrian traffic based on the recent completion of a housing development and various schools that are in this intersection. Looking forward to seeing that development as uh, we don't have roundabouts in Redlands, so this will be a a nice change for us. Next slide, please. In March, 2019, the city was awarded a Highway Safety Improvement Program grant, federally funded and coordinated through Caltrans. The construction for this project was completed in July, 2020. The project consisted of installing in-roadway lights on crosswalks along with ADA pedestrian push buttons. The push button talks, meaning when you push the button, it tells you to wait. When the in-roadway lights turn on, the push button tells you to walk in English and in Spanish. And as you can see, uh, the enhanced crosswalks are located at seven intersections in downtown Redlands. Next slide, please. And this is really what I wanna spend the bulk of our time discussing. I've become uh, much more familiar with crosswalk murals lately as a result of a project that was recently proposed in Redlands. I've been doing a lot of research on this and in the research that I've done, uh, I was particularly interested in the comprehensive report done by Bloomberg Philanthropies. As they describe it, the Asphalt Art Initiative responds to the growing number of cities around the world embracing art as an effective and relatively low cost strategy to activate their streets. While cities incorporate art into public spaces in a variety of ways, the focus of this initiative is what they're calling asphalt art, visual interventions on roadways, intersections and crosswalks, pedestrian spaces, plazas and sidewalks, and vertical infrastructure, utility boxes, traffic barriers and underpasses. One of their case studies that you're probably familiar with and I was most interested in was in Kansas City, Missouri. They received a $25,000 grant to transform an intersection that had been deemed unsafe. In order to slow traffic, they added stop signs where the most flagrant speeding was occurring. In addition to the stop signs, the curb extensions, which created the canvases for the artists to create the asphalt art murals, narrowed traffic lanes, which encouraged motorists to travel slower, 
when passing through or turning at the intersection. They collected data by recording the before and after speed of cars traveling through the intersection and measuring the distance of the crosswalk pedestrian must traverse uh, to cross the street. Study after study has shown slower automobile speeds are safer for all road users, as we know, including pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists. The odds of a fatality resulting from a car crash are directly correlated with the speed of the automobile. According to research, a crash involving an automobile traveling over 40 miles per hour increases the odds of a pedestrian fatality to over 90%. In terms of their um, post-study research, the, the travel speeds after the implementation, um, the design and implementation cut the average travel speeds roughly in half. Even more impressively is what the implementation did to the high speeds. Where there was a previously recorded high speed of 49 miles per hour, there was now a recorded high speed of 23 miles per hour. This improvement changes the odds of a pedestrian dying of a car crash from about 90% down to 10%. This is just one great example of how asphalt art has contributed to traffic safety. I was listening to a great uh, podcast yesterday as I'm still doing research on this topic. And um, uh, the podcast you know, talks extensively about all of these concepts. And I recommend checking out the Follow the Data podcast in particular, They've done an episode called Making Streets Safer with Asphalt Art. It's available on SoundCloud. And now just shifting gears to talk about this project, this local project in Redlands. The city of Redlands, uh, you probably know this, has some beautiful public art spaces. And when I was campaigning for city council in 2018, I was actually the only candidate who included increased public art as one of my top platforms, uh, the data that I was reading at the time suggested that not only does public art benefit the local arts communities and um, the arts economy, but it also supports tourism, placemaking, a sense of pride within the city. And there is even data to suggest that public art reduces crime in the surrounding areas. Especially during the pandemic, people are craving connection more than ever and art can often provide that. There is a real sense of community, but also inclusion depending on the message of the artwork. For all of these reasons and more, I've been a big fan of public art. So when the Artlands, a gallery and local arts nonprofit in Redlands was recently awarded an $8,000 grant from SCAG and Go Human to do the first ever crosswalk mural in Redlands, I was so excited. Unfortunately, we've encountered a few roadblocks, no pun intended, along the way, uh, but ultimately the project is moving forward one roadblock was that while the project was approved by our Cultural Arts Commission, it was denied by our Traffic and Parking Commission, citing Federal Highway Administration guidelines don't permit the use of colors other than muted earth tones. I asked for this to be brought to the City Council, and we had two meetings in July um, of lengthy discussion about this item. Ultimately, we voted three to two to allow for the mural to proceed as it was designed by the way, it's a beautiful uh, rainbow colored character drawing that you can see there on the screen. And the intent from the artist is to honor the LGBTQ community. And you know, I came here today really wanting to have a discussion with you all about your knowledge, uh, awareness of, and experiences with cities that have gone against FHWA guidelines to do this type of asphalt art. One issue raised by a council colleague of mine was around liability particularly from a safety standpoint. He was worried that we were going to get sued uh, if someone were to be hit in this beautiful crosswalk. Uh, he was also concerned about First Amendment issues. And so I'm, I know that you're the experts and I know that you have a lot of um, data and insight on this issue, at least I'm hoping so. So I'm gonna stop there in hopes that we can have a fruitful conversation uh, with your thoughts and expertise as it relates to asphalt art and crosswalk murals in particular in your cities or your regions. Thank you again for having me here today. Thank you, Council Member Davis, for highlighting uh, the work that you're doing in your city um, that's quite innovative and um, quite frankly, beautiful. Um, I, Having worked for a city, I understand how challenging it can be to secure um, authorization to do experimental treatments from FHWA or even Caltrans. And there are, um, you know, I'm sure, uh, 
there, I hope there are folks on the line who might be able to provide, you know, that discussion you're seeking. Um, I don't know if anyone who's in the room would like to um, ask a question or offer some experience that they'd like to share um, with their, their, again, experience relating to experimental treatments um, with crosswalks or perhaps with other sort of um, innovative treatments. Um, anyone have anything to offer or our panelists too? I would extend it to anyone in the room. Um. <laughs> you may be the expert then, <laughs> Councilmember Davis, in uh, your research. Um, I see a comment from Derek Towers. Derek, I don't know if you'd like to unmute and, um, oh, I see, you've considered but never gone after request for permission to experiment, experiment with MUTCD. And I was going to actually ask if anyone in the room had submitted a comment letter to MUTCD or F the feds about revising, revising the MUTCD. I know that was an, a recent opportunity to try to, you know, hopefully reshape that document, which is not, um, it sounds like serving many of our communities. Um, mm -hmm. So Derek or anyone else on the line, um, perhaps even one of our consultants have anything to offer on this front? I'll say that as a firm, we submitted a comment letter to uh, during the MUTCD mm -hmm. um, review process. And uh, I, myself, I have not worked with any uh, agencies on experimental products uh, or treatments myself. Uh, I'm sure that we have as a firm. Oh, and Drew is online on the line and she may be able to speak to this more directly because she has um, uh, many more years of experiences in consulting. Uh, but I'll also say that I did notice that at the ITE annual meeting today, there was a presentation on this exact topic um, and the use of paint. Uh, Peter Kuntz from Portland had uh, posted something on Twitter about it. So there was a presentation um, on the impact of, of paint on, on safety. So I can ferret Maybe. out that information and yeah, Tracy, and sorry, you're coming in a little soft for me. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't hear yeah. that well, yeah. apparently. Um, but but I do see um, an additional comment coming in from Demi Espinosa, um, uh, sending uh, praise uh, around the efforts to have community art in the streets, which I think many of us are hugely supportive of. Um, this was such an important issue for rural EJ communities in Muskoi. The county ended up saying no to our request for more community street art. And the question for you, um, Council Member Davis, can you explain how your, appro your approach to research, uh, your approach to research and how street treatments add to the value of community pride? Thank you so much, Demi, for the question. Um, and something that I said during the council meeting after you know, weeks of uh, exhaustive Google, Google searching on my end is I said to everyone, like, please pull out your phones and um, just please Google crosswalk murals. And you'll find if you look at the images, like there are already many cities across the country who are doing this. And so I, I became very curious about how those cities were going against guidelines to do this, especially in the last, I think, year or so. Um, you know, we've seen these amazing uh, murals pop up around social issues, Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ pride murals, right? And so I think that that speaks exactly to your question about how uh, a city and a street, you know, and a community can express um, their values of inclusion. And, and that typically, as I'm alluding to, um, means thinking about the people who are most marginalized and, and who have been historically oppressed and historically not uh, valued and included in communities. I think that that public art can send a really important message. And so I'm, I'm thrilled that the city of Redlands is moving forward with this mural. I'm hoping that it's the start uh, of more crosswalk art. And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm hopeful that in the next you know, few years, we can um, move the conversation on this because it seems like some cities are already moving in that direction. And, and from my brief you know, Google search research, it seems like, uh, like this can actually be a great safety intervention. I'm hoping that that preliminary data is accurate and uh, we'll start to see that. And I do see Demi has offered an additional comment um, really 
congratulations and well wishes for you and Redland City Council. Uh, and at your hearing, apparently there were quite a few folks um, who were uh, from the LGBTQ uh, community and beyond um, who were, uh, it sounds like, supportive of the work. Um, yeah. Uh Absolutely. I'll say it was one of the most moving council meetings I've experienced. People were sharing deeply personal stories about what this mural uh, mm -hmm. will mean will mean to them. And, and it's worth noting that of all the public comments, all of them, 100% of them were in support of the mural project. No one from the public was opposed to it uh, mm -hmm. at our meeting. So that, that was encouraging as well. And I see there's a question from the audience. Um, can you explain how your approach? Oh, I see, sorry, I see that already came through. It was just duplicative, uh, but thank you, Michael, for sharing. Um, and, and I think maybe, um, oh, and I see an additional question has come through as well. Um, I, I was just following up on that reference to the ITE meeting today and who was doing the presentation that Peter Kuntz had referenced, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Folks want yeah. To track that and down. I think uh, Drew, Drew, do you want to unmute and offer your experience or any insight into experimental treatments and crosswalk treatments? Or... I, I think just back to the council members, like question of the room is how to get past some of these risk um, management perspectives that local agencies take. Is um, you know the federal guidance, the federal highway administration was pretty clear; they don't like them. However, as long as the decision to apply art does not distract from the intent and purpose and safety benefits of the traffic control treatment, a traf your local traffic engineer or transportation engineer has the, has the opportunity to make a judgment that it is it will be safe. And a lot of agencies aren't ready to like utilize that judgment, but I think it's important to you know, remind ourselves that thoughtful conversations related to the application of the engineering license um, can can yield um, different outcomes. This is all really helpful. Thank you so much. And I see a couple of comments and responses in the chat too with additional resources that perhaps might be helpful and just throwing it out there, but perhaps at a upcoming quarterly um, meeting that we have of our active transportation and transportation safety stakeholders, perhaps we can carve out some time to facilitate this more targeted discussion about experimental treatments and those who've experienced some success with them in our region. Because again, having come from a local um, experience, I too know just the liability concerns from your legal staff um, and then FHWA and Caltrans, and it can be a bit um, daunting, right? So maybe we can make some time, but I think Demi's comment earlier regarding um, how inspiring the council, the city council meeting uh, member meeting was, right, in support of this. I wanted to ask Marvin specifically because Marvin, I, you, you do a lot of um, engagement with folks, and I was wondering if you had any. Uh, any really tips or practical advice for folks on how to engage the community more, right, with support of these projects? Because I think something we saw in the Zoom poll originally is community support and elected support can be a very significant issue. And how, how do you secure that for these projects that we want to happen? Yeah, I think actually the Go Human program is a great um, way for that. And especially the, the quick build ones that you guys are doing and that allow people to put them out and see them. Because like I said, um, these is still unfortunately pretty rare for these projects to be in place in the region. So people don't know how it'll work or unwilling to imagine that maybe it would work in their community. And so uh, the Go Human is a good program in that regard. Um, of course, cities don't have to wait for Go Human. They could put their own money up and do it, <laughs> which <laughs> I mean, it was a different topic. And but yeah. that, yeah, that you know, beyond just going door to door and finding out people's plan um, problems and that way, then yeah, Go Human is and or similar type of demonstration projects. And of course, um, just remind people, a lot of the cities now have active transportation and safe routes to school plans. So just dust those off and see the, what people were engaged with then. Yeah. yeah, demonstration projects can certainly be very powerful. And I know we had that plug at the beginning for the Go Human Kit of Parts, which is free, um, which hopefully more people will be um, and communities will be inspired to take to do as you're recommending, Marvin, to um, 
enable people to experience the treatments so that they're not these, um, you know, ideas that people think are coming from San Francisco or elsewhere, right, I think as some of you are highlighting, but um, can actually be applied in our region too. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. I'd also say too, um, um, actually one of the projects I highlighted and, and Eric surely sure knows um, the San Pablo Avenue in, in um, Palm, Palm Desert started out as Go Human Project and now they are just wrapping up construction of it. And I, I went out there a couple months ago before it wasn't done, but it's a great improvement. Yeah, and I, I think, um, I know Julia's on the line from our Go Human team. I don't know, Julia, if you wanna offer any words about uh, demonstration projects or quick builds or things that are possible. Sure, hi everybody. Um, just first, a huge, huge thank you to all the the panelists and the speakers, um, so much gratitude to all of you. Um, and yeah, just exciting to hear all of these reflections. Um, yeah, the, the Go Human demonstration projects have been pretty successful. Um, they've been taking different shapes and forms um, and we keep growing how we're, we're exploring how to do this with um, city staff, with community partners. We now have our kit of parts, we have four kit of parts um, that we, um, you know, hope that they're as accessible as possible to send out to communities and to cities to utilize, um, to showcase improvements, um, and to collect feedback, um, and to align that with some education and some messaging. Um, we, I've lost count, but we've done more than 40 or 50 demonstrations at this point, um, and I believe about a quarter, if not more, have moved forward in some way um, with the project being expedited, with allowing for more funding to be secured, with really changing hearts and minds um, with the value of these improvements. So yeah, the, the demonstrations have been really great. Thank you, Julia. Okay. I know that was unexpected, but I appreciate having you here because again, Julia is your ultimate connection to Go Human. If you, um, you know, those resources that were highlighted at the outset and you have an interest, um, her team can help you um, hopefully demonstrate these projects and convince folks in your communities that, that things are possible. And I should, I just wanna quickly add before, um, and I see Marvin, your hand is raised. Um, I know that the state and Caltrans are trying to kick off an action item um, to consider quick build and demonstration guidance. And so that's something that they're pursuing right now actively. And so my hope, my sincere hope is that SCAG as well as other cities and other Caltrans offices can be a part. So maybe this can become streamlined in the future and less of a hardship, right, for locals trying to do this work, which matters. Uh, Marvin, I wanna extend, um, yeah, uh, if you'd like to share. Yeah, yeah and I'd also um, say the other side of it, and it goes back to what Eric was talking about too, about the standards, is that, the, the ultimate issue is um, a lot of times that people are just scared of change. And so if the stuff is there from the beginning, you don't have to change. And so they, they don't come out mad because it was never different in the first place. <laughs> and I have, um, I'm, I'm not sure if there are other questions in the chat. I've not been um, monitoring it as quickly, but I do see that Tracy is referring to the podcast for folks if they wanna tune in to Making Streets Safer with asphalt art, which um, sounds like a really great thing to listen to while you're biking or walking about the region, perhaps, um, hopefully in the cooler periods. Um, Eric, I have a question for you. I, I think you're still on the line, right? Yes. And I, I know a bunch of folks were talking about funding, right? Infrastructure funding is hard to come by. And I know you were talking about HSIP funding and, you know, your ATP funding. And I know Marvin, too, was talking about some ATP, ATP projects that have been really great. And I wondered if you had any practical advice for folks about securing that funding, how, are, how you're competitive in getting it, because I know a lot of us apply and it, it, can, be, it can be challenging, right, even to apply. Um, do you have any tips for people? It, it was, um, I'll, be, I'll be honest, it, it was a nightmare. Um, it's, you know, we, we, we've had a good track record. And so in this, in, in this year's cycle five, we actually didn't, uh, we scored right under the cutoff line in the first round. And now we're going to get, we're going to get 50 of the $500 million coming in the second funding round. But um, 
boy, we spend a lot of money. We, you know, we pay consultants to hire us. I mean, we hire consultants to help us and, and that uh, we put a bit, lot of public involvement into it. And um, it's just very nuanced. I mean, I wouldn't, to, to write the first time ATP application, I wouldn't wish on anyone. Um, it, it's, and, and I guess the, it's the it's a good thing and it's and it's maybe a, a sideways thing too is that uh, I keep saying that it shouldn't be called active transportation program it should be called the dis disadvantaged community transportation program because even though that's just one of the score categories it, it's really the focus of all of the scoring categories and so you know one of the things that we got dinged on or that we in, in our in our debrief that we got remarked negatively on was that we had put certain aesthetic elements into our project, a lot of lighting and not just lighting, but some aesthetic lighting and some very interesting cool treatments. And, you know, one of the questions was, you know, wh why are we doing this in this disadvantaged community, which I thought was ridiculous. Um, you know, it was almost like, you know, it's a disadvantaged community. Shouldn't you be spending the money on more utility and less aesthetics, but, um, you know, it's, there, there's a lot of problems with ATP and that there's too many people scoring and their opinions are all different. Um, but it's rewarding when you get the money and we've certainly gotten our share and some of our cities have as well. Um, so my only advice is, is, you know, if you can afford it, hire a consultant that's got a winning track record. Um, and if yeah. you're trying it on, if you're trying it on your own, then be prepared to fail the first time and, and try again. Or in some cases, right? And I, 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 former grant applicant person for a city, and it was a tough time, I know, right? Uh, but I know that some, some more recently are offering support, technical assistance for folks who apply. I think Safe Routes Partnership is one of the resource, they offer that resource for folks. I know where um, I previously worked, LA Metro, that's a different county, obviously, offered some technical support for folks. So if um, consultant sounds like um, a huge ask, you know, to find that money for some of the locals, maybe they can seek out these other resources. And I think sometimes, um, oftentimes the Go Human newsletter tries to highlight those resources for folks um, so that they can, you know, overcome those challenges. But I'd say, you know, having written a ton of grants and scored a lot of grants more recently, my, my one tip would be try to find an application from successful a successful applicant, see what they, you know, did and talk to the funders directly if you can to learn what worked. Because I think when I met one-on-one -on -one with some of the funders, that certainly helps, right? Shaping the application so that it didn't feel as much as like, um, I don't know, like, uh, you know, as, as opaque or, you know, that I didn't understand how they were going to score us, but I know, and I hear, and I affirm what you're saying, <laughs> Eric, that it's, it's, and I appreciate your radical can candor <laughs> of how tough, how tough it has been um, for you in the past. Um, anything to offer um, on that end in terms of funding? I, I am curious, um, again, Marvin or Council Member Davis, if you have anything to add on that front, because I know that securing that community support, right, for these applications that you submit is absolutely critical, as well as your elected officials signing off on this, that this is something aligned with what their plan are and vision are for the community. Any uh, thoughts from um, Marvin or um, Council Member Davis on that front? I'll just say, yeah, I echo the, the challenging nature of this. Um, in my first year on the council, I was on our budget subcommittee and I was surprised to learn that we had no one on staff who was responsible for grant writing. And so that's something that I've been wanting ever since. And obviously with the pandemic, we had a bit of a challenging budget situation as did most everyone. Um, but now that we're in a better spot, that's on our list of priorities is to hire a grant writer for the city of Redland. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, that will help us, you know, achieve some, some funding goals and to create uh, beautiful projects like this one and beyond. Yeah, I'll just say um, I, I've actually scored ATP applications in the last two cycles. Um, and so it's interesting to see what everyone um, puts in usually we get about 10 applications a piece and we score them in teams and I think another couple of other people on here scored as well in the past um, and so you you get all sorts of different things in and you quickly learn which people are able to follow directions and which ones are don't and um, not saying not that I have um, 
I don't, I haven't looked at any of the CVAG ones and I, I know there's a winning record there, but one thing I would just caution everyone who's thinking of looking at ATP is to answer the question that they ask and not just go off on tangents. And if they ask a question and it has like a thousand word answer box, don't write 200 words that don't address the thing. Cause I've had to score a lot of applications down that did, you know, I, I look at application and they're 200 words out of a thousand and they've not addressed the issue. And so that's something that has plagued us. And another thing as well, um, in a project that the one that Demi brought up about Muskoy, one of the issues was that the, the first time they didn't get awarded, they finally got awarded the second time after they applied again. But part of the reason they didn't get awarded the first time is because they didn't listen to the community input on safety uh, parts of the, the project. Um, we had said like a whole list of things, you know, that we want to see. And the county was like redlined everything uh, because they didn't want to slow down cars. And, and so then they didn't get awarded that first time. And so the second time around, they added more of it and then they got uh, an award. And, but, you know, it just kind of goes back. Don't be afraid to make changes that, that are improved safety. And I think one additional thing to add from a former grant writer for a couple of cities, no application is ever just um, a lost cause, right? If it didn't win once, you can revisit it, you know, and work with the community to reshape it and better address the needs, right? And so it's it's something, again, you can repurpose. It's never, you know, the grant application that didn't succeed. It's something that you certainly have access to and can repurpose in the future. And I do see, um, <laughs> Marvin, you want to <laughs> offer again? I do see a comment um, from Demi, though. Um, Eric, you bring up a good point about ATP scoring needing to be revisited and technical assistant opportunities should be more readily available to smaller agencies in disadvantaged communities and working with CBOs that provide technical assistance should be the model. CBOs tend to have better practices for community engagement and are often trusted by residents over consultants. So very, very good points, Demi. Feel free to come off of mute at any point if you like. I know you've shared quite a few comments in the chat, but Marvin, getting to you. Yes. Um, the, yeah, just quickly going back to ATP. The other thing that would mark a score down that we saw a lot was when cities and agencies would try to mask uh, car improvements as an ATP project. <laughs> like they're going to yeah. build a sidewalk, but the current road is a two lane road and they ultimate with a six lane. So they want to build a sidewalk. And while we just have, we can't just put curb and gutter 40 feet away from the existing road. So we have to fill in this uh, space. And so then now you don't have an ATP project. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it sounds like Marvin, you as well as I know um, some SCAG staff, Corey, Corey, um, who's on our staff, they, you could potentially be a resource that people connect to, right? If they want to learn more about um, tips and tricks for succeeding with ATP applications, right? Until um, the process is revised and stuff, uh, perhaps perhaps they can reach out to you. Um, or again, Corey, who's on staff with us, Wilkerson, he, he certainly could be a resource. And I see, Eric, you have a, a, a comment as well? Yeah, just, on, just following up on on kind of a second chances. So, so this year, I am not a grant writer, I am an engineer. Um, and yet I, I was responsible for a grant. The, one of the projects that we're hopefully gonna get awarded is a $17 million grant for a long corridor, long arterial corridor. Um, but the first time we applied was the cycle four and we, we received 12 points more in cycle five because we learned from the comments we received and we sharpened our pencil and we, we improved the things that we needed to improve on. And we still just barely missed the cut, um, but then we made the, the augmented funding. So, um, you know, don't, even though it was kind of a nightmare experience for me, um, it's rewarding. And, and if you stick with it, if the project is important to the community, um, just reload for the next, next cycle. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for those uh, concluding comments for us. We have a couple minutes left, and I want to sh uh, thank all of our presenters today. Uh, I mean, it's enormously appreciated um, your time and hearing what you, you know, have shared about 
your challenges and your successes in your communities. Um, we will be sharing a recording with this as well as the presentations with folks who registered for today. We often get, you know, 100 people who register and then everyone wants to, you know, tune in on their own time, which is great, right, uh, that we have that flexibility now. Um, and so I know, um, I know our, our AV support, uh, Edward, hopefully you can share the remaining slides that we have, um, the concluding slides so that um, folks can see that this again was our 10th uh, traffic safety peer exchange, hopefully uh, speaking or repurposing language from uh, Eric, this was not a nightmare for you. Hopefully it was stimulating and hopefully we can connect you to the resources you need. I think that's what we endeavor to do. And so if you do have questions uh, that you still have, you didn't get to share in the chat, uh, you're more than welcome obviously to reach out to our presenters who will know best or to any SCAG staff. We wanna help support you as you try to eliminate traffic fatalities and serious injuries. And on the slide before you, you'll see, and we'll put in the chat for you and email you about this as well. We would appreciate it if you complete a survey to let us know how this experience was for you so that we can uh, better shape these going forward. And again, all of the recordings and presentations will be posted on this website and you'll get a bit of a thank you email from us um, afterwards so you can refer back to this. And again, I wanna thank enormously um, Eric, Marvin, Council Member Davis, your time was um, greatly appreciated. Um, and we hope we hope we can connect again in the future with you as well as the folks who participated today. Thank you all. Great. Thank you everyone so much. Thank you. Thank you.